I want to tell you a little bit about um, how the Jungle Moms program, or its its name in Achuar, Ikiyama Nukuri, which means women as protectors and defenders of the forest, how it's going to begin. Um, so first, just to center you around the mission of what we, what we attempt to do, can everyone see? Mm -hmm. um, so we really focus on um, reducing maternal and neonatal mortality by empowering women and communities of the Ecuadorian Amazon to ensure safe births, health, and well-being of the Achuar nation. So the Achuar people, as you have heard and seen um, in that fantastic video earlier before, are this incredible group of people who live deep within the Ecuadorian Amazon rainforest. And they live so deep in some of the most pristine primary rainforests that there are no roads for them to access the outside world and to gain the access to the resources that they need usually. Um, they've been so successful at keeping oil companies and mining companies out of their territory for so long, largely due in part to this wealth of forest and thick, lush Amazonian jungle that they um, And so, this woman, um, is Narcisa Machieta. And Narcisa is a very, very, maybe some of you who've been to the uh, Pachamama uh, fundraiser luncheons um, in November um, have met her. Um, she is a very powerful and special human being um, who is actually from another group of people, another nation. She's Shuar. The Shuar are neighboring to the Achuar. Um, for many generations, they have actually been enemies. Um, they had been fighting wars with each other over territory, over shamans, over witchcraft, um, and over women. And um, it wasn't until fairly recently, until the last 30 years, that the Achuar and the Shuar have ceased warring uh, with one another. But there are certain areas where they can't come together, for example, a Shuar man not marry an Achuar woman. Um, there's a certain case like that. Achuar women, however, can marry Achuar men. And this very woman, uh, at the very young age of 20, as she was working as an activist with her um, confederation of indigenous leaders, the Shuar nation, um, she was organizing women, uh, organizing women of her nation to lobby and protest against the oil companies that were coming in to threaten the oil exploration and extraction in their territory. And while she was working as an organizer and um, as an administrative leader, um, she met and fell in love with a very powerful Achuar leader, Santiago. Um, Santiago was the president of the Nai Association, which Nai is the Achuar Nation of Ecuador. It's their, it's their ruling body, their governing body. And um, Years ago, she moved to his territory and moved to their community, which is called Cuenza. And it is where um, she and he lived for several years. And for her, it was a very sort of culture shock. She, too, is experiencing culture shock because the Shuar live in a place where they're much closer to the cities, and so they've seen more contact with the, the, the world of the cities and have had much more. The women, for example, are very vocal. And she saw in these communities where she was living in and working in um, that the women were suffering, um, that their babies were getting ill, and that there were many cases of maternal death in her, in her community. Um, and she had many conversations with the women, um, intimate conversations, and she felt very compelled that she needed to do something. But everyone kept saying, well, what can you do? You're, you're a woman. There's not anything that you can do. But there was something about something about her community and about her passion that there was something left unsettled. So um, one day, she, many people, the, the Achuar and the Shuar, um, and many other indigenous groups who live deep in the Amazon uh, and not so deep in the Amazon, um, use a lot of... Um, 
they do a lot of dream work. Um, they work with their dreams, they work with the plants, they work with the spirits that live in the forest and they receive guidance and they receive sort of visions. And in many cases in our culture, we kind of spend a lot of times in our lives figuring out what am I supposed to do on this planet, what is my purpose. Um, in the Achuar culture and the Shuar culture, there is a lot of spiritual work that is done uh, with plants that helps bring people to find out what their purpose is, what their vision is. So one day, Narcisa had this vision um, where um, she saw this light coming from the sky in a way it was like this cosmic sort of astral force. And the light kind of reached her and it spoke to her and it said, you have to do something about the health of the living. She was it's going to be you. You're the one. And she, this, this, this vision was given to her felt like she had to do something about it, but she wasn't sure how she would make that happen. And then one day, um, she was working in her garden um, with her baby, um, not this baby, but another baby, um, and all of a sudden an airplane comes, and she's greeted by this incredible woman who also had a vision, who also had a dream. Um, that woman So I'm not going to do so much justice to your vision, but I really want to emphasize the importance of what it took to bring these two visions together to, to give birth to this program, because it's, it's a dream work, it's the visioning that is really what brought us all together here today. So Margaret Love is a midwife, and she was on an incredible Pachamama journey um, to visit Achua territory in the community of Charamensa which is just to the north of Pumas. And she was visiting with the group and the people in the community and mentioned, um, I'm a midwife, and I'm a retired midwife. And suddenly, all these pregnant women appeared. And if I am not, if I'm not doing justice, please feel free to jump in. Um, but all these women came up saying, well, we would like to have you listen to the heartbeat, or we would like to have you, you know, feel the position of our babies because we're, we're tired of, we want to learn from you, we want to learn from your culture of birth position because we are so tired of having our babies die. We are so tired of having our sisters and our mothers die that we want to really, we want to learn more about what your tradition is. And so um, this, again, when, when placed with this sort of incredible thing that happened in life, Margaret was very sort of moved by this experience. And through a dream and through vision work, um, there was this light that appeared in the sky. And it was this light that was like the lights of the city that were coming and coming towards her and connecting her. And this all happened right around at the same time. So when Narcisa was doing her vision work and seeing this light, we were doing the same vision work. And it really what what came what happened was the lights came together. And so Margaret arrived in the community because Belen Paez, the president and um, longtime executive director of Fundacion Pachamama said, Margaret, you need to become in touch with this woman, Narcisa. She's a leader, she knows what's happening, and this is something so they met in the community of Confuenza and soon together came to realize that they were destined for one another to birth into existence the Jungle Mamas program, which collectively was to provide um, education and teachings that work to revitalize and hold space and, and value and protect the traditions that Achua women have giving birth, while at the same time providing them with the tools of Western midwifery and Western birth conditions, so that in the case that there is a birth risk or a birth emergency, they don't have to die in the community. So empowering them with the tools that they need to continue maintaining their cultural lifestyle, while not having to necessarily navigate the culture shock of Western Um 
So Narcisa is our local coordinator. She's our program coordinator. Um, she really wish she could be here today. She sends everyone love. Um, and is very much present at this moment, and it's the it's the coming together of these two incredible women that is what makes this program so very alive. Um, so I'm just kind of want to bring in a little bit of the idea of why why are we here to talk about maternal health? Why jungle health? Why is it that those of us who care about the well-being of this planet, why is it that those of us who care about the well-being of forests, why should we care about maternal health? Why, what is the connection between the two? So in many cases, in many situations, um, when you're talking about some of the most pristine forests, the most beautifully protected natural resources, it's not like they're, they're static. It's not like they're in a vacuous space. They're people that live on them in those areas. They're, they're people indigenous people, rural people who live and protect those lands. And their livelihood comes from them. And their health and well-being comes from them. And so I want to kind of plant the idea, this sort of connecting force, um, that when we think about forest conservation, when we think about keeping forests and keeping natural reserves clear and clean and healthy, you really have to start thinking about the people that live on that land as well, um, and the, their well-being. Because when you have people who are the stewards and the protectors of the forest, who are not living in a place where they're empowered, who are not living in a place where their well-being and their health and their education are taken are taken into account or made a priority, you're not going to assure the well-being of that forest, of that land, of that water source. Um, and that oftentimes gets made invisible when we talk about conservation. We often forget the voices of the people who are on that land. So it's time to, as we retake up these conversations, to remember the people who are on those lands. So I'm just going to throw in some, some theory here. Um, we talk about sustainable forestry management. Um, we, we're really getting at the people who are living on the land. So we talk about intergenerational access to the resources is secure. That means that it's not just this is my land and this is my lifetime and as long as the land is good in my lifetime everything is good. It's thinking that my grandchildren and their grandchildren are going to have the same space that I have today. If not better. Um, that's something that is very much present and conscious um, and out and going and ongoing in the work that we do with the Achuar. They're not thinking about it in terms of our territory or my territory. They're the stewards of the territory for their future generations. Um, so another necessity for maintaining sustainable forests is that their rights and responsibilities to manage equitably and cooperatively are clear. Um, so that means that the people who are on the territory, who are on the land, have their rights assured, have their responsibilities clear, and are able to manage those rights in the way that they see fit. And the most important one um, is that the health of the people, cultures, and forests is maintained. So we're not just talking about, you know, buying a bunch of land and then calling it a national park. It's making sure that the people who are living on the land, who are living in these spaces, are accounted for. Because if I have, if I'm living on a piece of land, and suddenly my child falls ill, or my family, for whatever reason, someone that falls ill in my family, and I don't have the resources to pay or to provide them, I'm going to cut down a tree, or I'm going to look for some sort of way that I can get them and provide the services that I need to them. When you really kind of work and you work to empower the people that are that are have these these, these basic needs, we all have basic needs: of education, water, healthcare. Um, when those needs are accounted for, you have less of a likelihood that people are going to exploit them to go into those areas. So this is what we're talking about. This is this is a beautiful part of the Amazon, very close to Pumbwetsa. 
this wonderful area is healthy when people work there. Um, so just kind of explaining a little bit about like what is this, what is the Achor space, what what is Achor life like, what is it like for a woman who lives in Achor territory. Um, so an Achor woman um, will start to have children as soon as she possibly can. It's common to see women who are already pregnant with children at age 13, 14. It's also common for women to have children, upwards of um, anywhere from three to eight children. I know a woman who has eleven children, um, and it comes from this. It comes from this culture, this warrior culture, of the fact that you know years ago um, the men had to fight in wars because they were fighting with other Achuar, they were fighting with the Shuar, and they were killing each other. And so you needed to have a healthy family, a big family so that you could protect your territory, so that you could work the land, you have just a good family. So the ideal family is a big one. Um, and it comes from this idea of we have plenty of territory, so we don't need to even worry about our family sizes. So the Achuar woman um, is responsible for providing food and for providing livelihood and well-being to people in the family. Um, and this happens primarily Chakra is the garden that surrounds the house where the families live in. Um, it can be up to an acre in size, and it's where um, it's where they cultivate their life force, uh, their life su life sustenance, which is known as yucca. Yucca is manioc root or cassava. It's a staple in many diets in tropical regions, in Africa, in the Caribbean, and Central and South America. So this woman is actually in this picture. Um, cultivating yucca. She has just recently taken the yucca out of the ground and is with these little stalks right there, has chopped off the stalks from the yucca and is in the process of replanting the yucca. Um, from the yucca comes a beverage called chicha, which is a fermented yucca beer, which they cook with boiled water and chew. The chew, 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 spit into a pot, and then it ferments, and that is like the life sustenance of the whole family. The men drink it, the women drink it, the children drink it. The younger children don't drink it when it's high in alcohol content, it's super sweet. Um, you can also see in the background there are other herbs that are being cultivated. There's um, citronella, there's, uh, I believe that is onion. It's the place where they cultivate all of their food. sweet potatoes, um, fruits and veggies, um, where they cultivate their med medicinal plants as well. And it is also the space where the Achuar woman is In Achuar culture, traditionally there are no midwives, there are no birth attendants. When it comes time for a woman to give birth, she feels her labor, she lets her family know, has her daughter or her son prepare little pads or little, little rags and she goes off by herself into the garden um, and this is how they've been doing it for generations and generations and generations um, this is another example of the chakra there's a woman working in it um, so they give birth they usually set up like a post a wooden post that's about this high and I'm just going to demonstrate because why not? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, like the typical way Ashwar women give birth is by holding onto this post and squatting, like so. Or like so. And um, it's a really sacred time. It's a time where no one, not, no one of the family, no father, no mother is allowed to intervene um, because it's a place where primarily for the mother and for her baby and for the spirits in the garden to, to bring this new life into existence. And so it come, you know, they say, like, well, why is that? And they say that birth is something that is not for the eyes of anyone else. No one else has the right to touch you or to see you in this process. Um, 
And so what, what often happens um, in the case of the Atuar and in the case of many other indigenous groups um, in all over the world is they don't live in total isolation like the surrounding cultures. So when we say that the Atuar live deep in the jungle, um, that doesn't mean that they're far removed from the influence of, of the outside, from the influence of Western culture. And so that means that there is a rapid change in their diet, um, in the food that they eat. Um, they didn't always used to live in communities. Um, it wasn't until about 30 years ago when the war stopped that they started to live in communities. So that means that people have centered, they used to live dispersed throughout the jungle and now they're sort of living in this one area that's surrounded by the airstrip, which is their main source of access in and out of the territory. And as they've settled there, the population has grown, which means that if you have one water supply, which is a little creek, that means the whole community is relying on one water supply as the population of the community is growing, which is realistically cause for contamination of water living there. And so um, there have been a lot of changes, and these changes have affected greatly how women have been giving birth. It's caused for a lot of birth complications. Um, the most common birth complication among Atuar women is postpartum hemorrhage, um, and which can lead very quickly to death. So, um, basically, um, you know, you can sort of think, well, did they have that problem before? Um, they did, and they did have plants that they used, but it's something that's definitely happening way more frequently that they don't have a sort of response to get there. Um, and many of these communities are compromised also by their communication systems. So, for example, in the case that you or I have a postpartum hemorrhage if you're able to give birth, um, we can just call the hospital or already in the hospital. Um, and in the case of the Atuar, um, some most communities only form of communication is a high-frequency radio system that only operates two hours out of the day if it's not raining. And it's the Amazon rainforest, so it's <laughs> raining quite a bit. Um, so if you just happen to have a birth emergency and it's raining, it, you're limited by that. That's weather. If you don't have the money to access a plane flight or to pay for a plane flight, that's another so there are all these limits that are causing for, or if a little mouse has chewed up the cable that you need to call the radio, that's another thing. So um, these are the realities that were faced by these women. These are the realities that the women who were talking to Margaret were speaking um, of. These were the realities that Narcissa saw in her community when the women were giving birth and having these birth complications and people were to do without it. And so, um, the work that we do is really centered upon um, working with a team of incredible women. Oh wait, these, these guys are precious. <laughs> so, as you can see, these are happy children. <laughs> and they're riding on a banana bus, um, <laughs> which was produced and grown by their mothers in the chakras, in the gardens. So when they have the time and when they have the ability to grow the chakras, and they're not worried about the, 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 the illnesses of their children, they have the time and the ability to ensure the health and well-being of these adorable boys. Um, so here we get into a little bit more about the work that we do. So as I said earlier before, there are all these limits that these people encounter due to communication, uh, due to socioeconomic differences, not only to mention the fact that when you do finally get out into the hospitals, into the cities, nobody speaks Achua. Nobody speaks Shua. They only speak Spanish. And they're often met, as with any <coughs> realities, you go to any clinic in, or any hospital in San Francisco and you will immediately encounter health inequalities, you will immediately encounter language barriers, you will immediately encounter racism. And so, um, uh, it's often the case that when these women do find themselves um, in the hospitals, can you imagine going from a culture that views birth 
as sacred to the point of it being completely taboo for anyone to hear you or see you or touch you, to go to a culture where you have to have be touched seven times and you have to be seen and you have to be heard and analyzed and touched, it's, it's a big shock. It's very So the work that we do in a way is trying to take the best practices of those both worlds of both of those worlds and really combining them so that the, the agency and the power is within the communities to access those resources. So um, this is a wonderful <laughs> this is a wonderful little simulation um, in one of our workshops. Um, what we do um, is to really work to create a space of trust and safety because that is the place where you can really engage on a person-to-person intimate level with people and kind of be vulnerable and at the same time um, have really difficult conversations that were pre- previously not acceptable to talk about. Talking about birth, talking about domestic violence and reproduction or family planning were not something that were accessible or even okay to talk about started and you know this is something that we've been going along as we've been going along we've been able to work up the trust and the confidence with uh, the people with the Atuar so that we can have these conversations um, so um, a lot of the work that we do are through acting and through the simulation of real life situations and so this is a situation where this this is this is our local coordinator sub local coordinator Mercedes who is a pregnant woman, and these are all of our incredible uh, workshop participants, and they're the children, they're her children. And she's, you know, about ready to give birth, and she has to take care of all these children. And it's a way, if they're really funny, they're really joyful, and it's a way for people to kind of open up and have these real conversations about areas that they wouldn't necessarily have a place to talk about. Um, Lots of games. In this case, in the Jungle Mama's case, this is the first time that anyone has been able to work with Ochoa women. Um, I don't know, some of you might have been to Ochoa territory, but when when you enter into a community, um, you will note that they're very, very formal. Um, They don't greet you with a hug. It's a very West Coast thing to do. Um, (laughs) And... um, handshake if that and very very formal and it's even more so um, if you are a woman um, they will often be serving chicha on the sidelines they don't have a place or space to speak publicly to address you publicly um, and in the history of the work of Pachamama there has not we have not been able to, to work as directly with the women as we liked until the Jung Mama's program so in many cases, in these workshops, um, these are the first spaces for women, Achua women in the communities, to come together and be with other women, and to share with other women. Not just washing clothes in the, in the creek or drinking chicha with your sister. To be with other women from all over the territory and to be able to share their experiences about about their families, about what they've learned. So this is like some of the first places that they've been able to share. Um, this is Narcisa. Um, we were in the process of building a composting dry toilet. Um, we involve all everyone in the family. The big lesson that we've learned is that if you are coming to do empowerment work with a group of people, we talk about women empowerment first. You can't empower the women without empowering the men. I'm going to use our famous analogy that we always use in our program. But it's like kind of like a hand. So your hand needs your palm and it needs the back of your hand in order to function. If you cut off like the back part of your hand, the front part of your hand can't work. So in working with the achoir, working with the men and working with the women, it's like the men and the women are working together to make
make sure that this kind of work is possible. Um, so uh, that includes working with children. That includes creating spaces. So if you're a mother and you really want to attend births, you really want to learn about the work that we do and to be involved, um, but you have like a, a two-year-old baby, we create a space in our workshops so that women can bring their children and breastfeed be mothers, because that is what it means to, in this case, to empower people, is like understanding where they're coming from, what their real situations are, and going with it. Um, this is a fantastic picture from a moment. So um, this is actually, it looks like they're playing a game, um, but they're actually singing a war song. Um, the women would, so would the men would go off into war, um, and you could tell um, they would come back and the women would greet them by singing to them. And so this is like, this is a, a joyful song where they're, they're standing in a line and they're walking down and they're greeting the men and there is this sort of ritual where they all bless the men with chicha afterwards. It kind of works to show like this collective work that happens. Um, so some of the work that we do, um, is uh, by providing safe birth kits. Um, we hold space for women who still want to give birth in the traditional way by themselves within the gardens. Um, and this is a woman from a wonderful community, Sukinsa. Um, she's pregnant with her first daughter. Um, she was 14 in the picture, and she's about 16 or 17 now. Um, and she's posing with the birth kit. And inside each birth kit um, comes the following. We have a bar of soap, um, just having hands clean and sanitation is a big thing in reducing uh, the risk of infection. Um, there are sterile cord, sterile strings um, for cord care. Um, there are cotton blankets um, to attend the baby and to receive the baby. Um, there's a candle, um, in some cases flashlights um, for nighttime deliveries. Um, there are gloves, and there's this really great traditional shawl that they use to carry their babies so that when they're working in the garden, they can have their baby on their backs. Um, and also a baby hat, the first set of baby clothes, so it's not to lose any heat, even though the jungle seems like it would be hot, sometimes it's cold. Um, so these elements within, oh, within the kit, um, we, in the workshops that we do, um, we work to educate, um, our team of uh, birth attendants, of master trainers, we call them, um, in implementing the use of these kits. Um, so each pregnant woman um, receives a birth kit, and she gets to decide whether she wants to have a master trainer attend her birth, or if she wants to give birth by herself in the garden. Um, but she has been instructed in its use, and the, the, the use of birth clean delivery kits and safe birth kits, um, I don't have the exact statistic, but um, have played a significant role internationally in reducing maternal mortality. Um, just to give you kind of a brief idea of where we are in Ecuador, um, so uh, the maternal mortality rate in Latin America is 140 out of 100,000 lives. And in Ecuador, it is 110 out of 100,000 births. Um, it is one of the areas that ha it is one of the countries that has the highest birth uh, maternal mortality rate in Latin America, in South America. Um, about 30 percent of the population in Ecuador is indigenous, and it is particularly within the areas where that are more densely populated with indigenous people, that those maternal and infant mortality rates are the highest. So the areas where they're the highest are in Corona Santiago, in Pastaza, and Chimborazo. And we are working, or Jungle Moms is working, is in Corona Santiago and Pastaza. And Chimborazo is more in the Andes. But it's largely due to the fact that they're so far removed from access, there are no hospitals, there's no way people to get access in the case of um, uh, postpartum hemorrhage or all of these other schedule emergencies. So 
they're situated in a place where they're not, they have not been getting the access that they need. Um, again, this is a beautiful example of the, the balance of the mother and the father raising this beautiful little baby. Um, so what are this particular work, what is the particular work that we do? Um, just recently in this last year, in 2013, we started collaborating um, with another organization called One Heart Worldwide that works on maternal and infant health in Mexico, Nepal, and Tibet. They specialize in working with native and um, rural populations in these areas. And so we've been working with them to better see how can we take the work that we've been doing over the years, which has been primarily focused on uh, safe birth education, midwifery education, basic health and sanitation, and scaling it, taking it to scale and impacting more people. So we've developed a curriculum called the Health Outreach Provider Training for Community Empowerment, where we train our master trainers. We have, there are about 6,000 Achuar living on the Ecuador side. I think there are about 8,000 Achuar living in Peru. We have not yet worked with the Achuar in Peru, but hopefully that will change soon. Um, and of that 6,000, we have been able to um, reach uh, approximately 60% of that group of people through this training program. So these are these are some of the women, our master trainers. Um, there are 26 master trainers who come throughout all over the territory. Um, the way Oshawa territory works is that there are communities, and then the communities are sort of set and organized into what's called associations. And there are 12 different associations throughout the territory. Um, and we have been working with master trainers who come from 11 different associations, but have not yet reached uh, the remaining 40% of the population. So this is Narcisa, our coordinator, and Mercedes, our local coordinator. And they are not only really incredible logistical coordinators, but they are also incredible workers. Mercedes uh, is one of our workshop participants who has been with Java Mamas from day one. Um, she has probably attended maybe 40 births now, 40 or 50 births within her community. Um, Narcisa also attends incredible birth, uh, births in her Schwar communities as well. And um, they are just really special. Um, so some of the work that we do within these um, master training, these master trainers, uh, is again, as I said before, uh, really doing simulations, so playing out, acting out the birth. Um, so what we talk about are not only like what a safe birth looks like, a safe normal birth, but how to, for example, attend to a birth where the baby is, you know, um, slightly positioned differently, or not necessarily attend to the birth, but how to feel the position of the baby. And we've been working with these master trainers so that they are able to know their limits. Um, so for example, um, it is their responsibility to provide prenatal care to the pregnant woman throughout her entire pregnancy. And this master trainer is responsible for identifying um, risk factors. So for example, they know how to calculate when the baby should be due, approximately what's the size it should be, um, and what position should it be in. And so, if, for example, if the baby is butt or feet first, that is a birth that could potentially be risky, really risky within the community. And she works directly with the family and with the community leaders to develop a birth plan and an evacuation plan. So early on, the family can, yeah, already plan for possible. In the case of a normal birth, a low risk birth, they're able to deliver as they have been. Um, um, recently, we were actually invited to present at a conference of the International Confederation of, of Midwife, Midwives, um, where they presented the Achuar birth model. Um, this conference was about a year ago, and we were able to get a lot of attention and collaboration. Um, 
here are some of our master trainers um, measuring vital signs, taking vital signs, um, so that they can measure and keep track of uh, you know, heart rate, and blood pressure of the mother during pregnancy to know, ooh, you have signs of perhaps high blood pressure. So that is another risk that can cause for problems we can send you out. So here they are practicing taking pulse, um, also calculating the fundal height, so figuring out based on like position of the baby, how many months it's due. Um, this is one of our incredible Ecuadorian midwives, Katya, who's a great educator. Um, here we have a young man who's also learning how to calculate um, as well. His wife is pregnant at that workshop. Um, so these women, since June, have been walking around the territory and have been visiting women, pregnant women, all throughout the territory and collecting data and collecting information and attending births and successfully navigating emergencies. Um, and uh, because of this incredible group of 26 women, we've been able to um, monitor 153 different pregnant women, uh, which is the first time we've been able to actually get data, get information because it's been so remote, um, not even the Ecuadorian government has figures about what the maternal mortality rate is in the Ochoa. Um, so yeah, creating opportunities, creating a place for women to come up and share their experiences and to mobilize in spaces that they haven't necessarily been given before. Um, this, I'm reaching the end of this, but I want to also make sure um, but basically, um, through this, through the master trainers, um, we have really been able to move forward, um, and there are women who are really working to have, um, have an impact. And there's this one woman, actually, I'll share just a brief impact story with you. Um, her name is Nungui, and she's 64 years old. Short, actually, there's a picture of her right here. This is no queen. And she is from a community called Sapapensa, which is one of the largest Dachuar communities in the territory. She came, she arrived to one of the workshops because her husband uh, said, my, my wife is an incredible midwife. And this was so unusual to us because traditionally, you know, there aren't any midwives that they give birth by themselves. This woman, the other in November, said to me, Robin, I have attended the birth of every single woman in my life. People know me because I attend to births. I have 11 children, and I became a midwife when I delivered my first baby. Um, at age 12. And she, um, she said, I do not speak Spanish. This is all translated to me. I do not speak Spanish. But the knowledge that I have is so important. And the people in my community recognize that my knowledge and my passion and my power is so important. And they want to see me succeed. And they want me to share my knowledge with the best of the women in our program. Um, and she came back in November uh, with her intern, who she hired. Um, her intern is 15 years old, um, who writes and reads and speaks Spanish, and she basically has her intern come along with her, accompany her in her prenatal visits, as they, they literally walk for hours in the jungle together, and she dictates uh, the, the birth clinical histories and the, the checkup histories with this woman. Um, and she said to me, she said, we were so successful in, in, um, in attending to these births and the community was super excited about receiving the birth kits and everything that we were able to effectively initiate a maternal health policy in our community. Which is a really big deal because women are not traditionally allowed to become a part of the local governments. Um, in some communities, you're actually seeing women presidents 
she said that um, from now on, if you have just recently given birth, um, you have seven weeks of leave, of maternity leave, from your community obligations. So in most indigenous groups in Ecuador, in the nations, um, they have what's called the minga, which is a Quechua word, which basically means like collective work. So everyone, every week you have to do a minga, which means cleaning the airstrip, or building a house, or cleaning the garden. And if you don't participate, you have to pay $3 in fine. Which if you don't have money, that's a lot of money to you. And so, and it's hard labor. The women have to not only work, but make the chicha, provide the chicha for everyone. And they said, Nungui said, now women are exempt from participating in the Minga after giving birth because our community has effectively recognized the importance of healthy mothers why it's important to not have them engage in manual labor practices because that can cause all kinds of postpartum problems. And so it's really, again, about this coming together of um, making sure that the mothers and the babies are healthy in a way that is culturally appropriate, in a way that they themselves see fit, and they're in charge of that. Um, as a result of that, they are not having to worry about you know, cutting down trees to pay for illegal logging so that they can access health care or, or go out into the hospital and spend all of their time in the city to navigate those structures. And so um, it's, they're all, we're all connected and they're all connected and right there who are affecting that change, so I want to make sure that there's time for questions, um, and I thank you for your time and hearing about the work that we are doing, and thank you. who have come to the workshops, who have showed up, are there because they feel a calling to help people in their community. And they've been chosen by the people. They've been elected by their people in their community. Um, and over time, we've seen many women, many of these women have actually been attending births on a regular basis of the people within their community. And they say, you know, Robin, like, I have a job. I'm actually a teacher in the community, and I don't know how to juggle the time. I love donating my time, but literally I was with this woman from like 11 o'clock at night until 4 o'clock in the morning and then had to teach a class the next day. And I, it's my time and I love to donate that time, but I need to also feed my family. So this, this, this question, this issue of like paying for your services has definitely come up. And this, we're living in, this is a society, this is a culture where money has not been in their society for very long, in the last maybe 20 years or so, you can get money. Most people don't have it because if you're a professor, or a teacher, or uh, a leader, or employed by the government in some kind of a way, you don't really have a steady sense of income. A lot of it is done through trade or whatever. Um, so this is in many ways generating a source of income, generating the possibility for a source of so we've been working very much directly with the women in the community to figure out a way, well, what can we do? How can we, how can we make this work and have it be a sustainable thing? It's just paying people. And if you're an outside entity and you suddenly leave, like it doesn't, it's not sustainable. Um, so right now, um, what we have been doing with these particular master trainers, they are agents of the Jungle Mamas program. They're like 
local coordinators, they're master trainers. And so what we've been doing um, is each woman has the has committed to providing prenatal care to each mother within her community and a series of communities that she said she's willing to be responsible for. So that means agreeing to, at the very least, doing three prenatal visits and one postpartum follow-up. They're not obligated to attend the birth because many women don't want to have their births attended to. Um, and in those visits, they're responsible for taking down clinical history and writing, writing feedback and updates about this woman. Um, and so, um, for those visits that we do, we do pay them because they're helping our program, they're helping the program to make sure that we have, we have the sustenance, we have the information, and it's also providing them with a sense of livelihood um, so that they can then take back to their husbands and their families, hey, look, I'm legitimate now. There's a space for me within our structure. And over time, as we look in ways to kind of transition the, the leadership and the ownership into their hands, we're also looking at ways to kind of work with them and develop administrative skills, develop leadership skills, how to run a program, for example. Um, one of the things, one of our goals, which was sort of affected currently by the dissolution of our organization, was that we had the we have the intention, and we're going to do it, which is going to take a little while, um, of creating a curriculum called the Skilled Birth Attendant. Right now, if you're an indigenous midwife, you're considered a lay midwife, and you're not recognized in any official way. Right now, the only people qualified for saving the life of a mother is the gynecologist, obstetrician, and the nurse. And they're the only people that are recognized. And right now, there is this whole intercultural health structure that is being built in, into Ecuador, but they only really recognize traditional midwives as bridges to send people to the hospital so that they can get more people in the hospitals. That is their concept of reducing maternal mortality, is more births in the hospitals. And so um, our dream, and this dream, it came very much from these women, is creating a category of healthcare provider that is somewhere between nurse and lay midwife, so that they have the skills that they need to, in some ways, be like qualify the international standards and protocols, while at the same time totally holding space for their wonderful traditions and knowledge that they have in the community. And it's our like goal for this year or next year to be able to get that kind of curriculum approved by the government so that the government recognizes in a very official way, in a financial way, that these women can provide the sources. It's a big goal, but we're So, what is happening with these master teachers, uh, master trainers? Trainers. Clearly, they're trained, and so they can help people. But when your office is closed down, what happens with those kits? Who do they report to? Uh, how does what's happening? They're still visiting pregnant women because that's what we we've talked about it. Just because the government shuts down an organization, an institution, doesn't mean that women will stop making birth. They will stop turning the And so they're still working, they're still visiting. Some people might be slowing down. It's, po it's possible that like there's been some slowing down of that, but people are still being attended to. We are still providing clean delivery kits, safe birth kits. Um, you know, our work in some ways has been affected, but at the same time, we are Jungle Mamas is a program of Pachamama Alliance, so we have immense support and immense commitment um, from our allies and partners up here um, to keep that work going, and we're still very much moving forward. Thank you. Question. Yeah. Abortion is illegal in Ecuador, and so it is illegal. And uh, of course, in any country where it is illegal, it happens illegally. Um, and there's all kinds of interesting political movements going on down in Ecuador about revoking the illegality of it. Um, but we do not advocate it or talk about it really. 
in our workshops, we do touch briefly on, not in major detail yet, um, on family planning and the various family planning methods that do exist in Ecuador. Um, our, cons our philosophy has always been one of, if you provide people with the information, they will take that information to their families, to their spouses, and they will make the decision that is best for them. We do not advocate, like, the, this is the best method that you must use. Our approach to family planning and access to birth control is not one of a population control mechanism. It's more like this is information that you and your partner can choose to empower yourselves on how you want to create your families. Um, and so we talk about that information and talk about which ones are more available in Ecuador and which ones don't exist. Um, family planning has been, I mean, it's very, very controversial all over the world. Um, and it's been specifically controversial with the Achuar and with indigenous groups over the Amazon. Um, we haven't made major moves to talk about it hugely in depth um, because we haven't gotten extreme official requests from it. However, this last year, um, we've been receiving way more requests, not only from women kind of secretly in workshops, but like, we want to hear more about family planning, we want to stop that big um, it, It's been coming from the men, and it's been coming from the men, male leadership, and um, so that's some, on one of our plans, too, is to incorporate uh, discussions on family planning, not only family planning, but also on domestic Like, like, what, what, how do they space their children? Oof. Well, it's really common nine to see a pregnant, <laughs> yeah, nine months. It's really common to see a pregnant woman breastfeeding. And that is also one of the issues, and that is one of the areas, yeah, causing anemia. It's, so, you know, people want to learn about that. They do breast with them. Oh, I'm just saying it's really common to see a, a pregnant woman who is also breastfeeding while she's simultaneously pregnant. So that's like draining of her forces while she's also preparing the chicha, gardening in the garden. And so those are the, some of the risks that are put upon the Achuar woman. Um, one of the reasons why they there are so many risks and health problems among babies is because the Achuar woman has so much work to do that she doesn't have time to be constantly breastfeeding. And this is what they say. Um, it's common to see, like we've asked them, so like how long do you guys breastfeed for? When do you stop breastfeeding or when do you stop solely breastfeeding? And we've heard people stop solely breastfeeding at two to three months, feeding them plantain water, which is contaminated often. So one of the things that we do advocate is like rest for at least for six months. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Robin again for your incredible. <laughs> <laughs> um, wonderful to hear all the detail of this program, and I feel like I'm the the midwife to the midwife program. I led the trip that Margaret um, was first on, where she uh, was approached by men and women to uh, to to start such a program. And thank you, Margaret, for taking on that challenge and rising to not only start it but to to create it for many many years and handing it over to to Robin to continue it.